Um, so welcome everyone. This is our second in-person JQI seminar. We are very, very excited to have Susanna Yellen here from Harvard. So Susanna is one of the great titans of quantum optics and cavity QED theory. Um, she knows exactly why cavity QED is true and exactly when the basic picture breaks down. Um, and so we are very, very excited to have her here today to tell us many things. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, that's the first time that somebody called me a Titan. Uh, I will, I will forever, I will forever remember this. This is great. Um, but of course, it's also, man, this is so exciting. This is my first actual in-person travel to to talk physics to somebody in quite a long time. Well, I, I don't need to tell you how that feels. This is fantastic. Um, so you guys know I'm a theorist, right? And I've been introduced to and for five minutes or so to this technology, which is really amazing, um, which has two, two disadvantages. First of all, that I have to somehow deal with this, namely, for example, with this fancy laser pointer, which kind of does what I want. Um, and the second thing is that I don't get my presenter views. Um, and that's, that's really how it's, that means I'm, if I tell nonsense, then uh, just call me to it. Um, other than that, um, I have a couple of, of breaks built in. Sorry, I need to, to run my, my timer here because otherwise um, um, I have a couple of breaks built in. So, so if, there, if there are a lot of questions or if I should go slower, faster, so I can kind of adjust the talk. So please feel free to, to really ask when, when something is not good. All right, so um, let me jump right in. So this is uh, about quantum optics. First of all, sorry, but what I really wanted to say is thank you so much for actually having me. Thanks, Alicia, for putting all the work in. Um, so I'm going to talk about quantum optics and applications with cooperative 2D arrays. And um, I think quantum optics clear, applications clear, 2D is clear. But I really want to emphasize cooperative. Um, this will somehow probably get lost when I talk about some of the applications, but everything really depends on cooperative. Actually, there's one exception, but I will tell you. Ha. Hello? <laughs> Thank you. All right. So. Um, so the goals is like, I give you a couple of the goals of the applications. So the first is just it still doesn't work. <laughs> what what do I do? Technical difficulties. It gets confusing. Okay. Excellent. Thank Sometimes you. it gets confused and it doesn't know how to pass the zoom around. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have a we have a two D array. Um, which is um, which you can just imagine, let's say, as a as a lattice of let's say two level atoms or some kind of radiators, quantum. Um, and the first thing is that we are looking at this thing: how can it reflect light? Um, then I will show you a little bit how you how we can do spatial light modulation with something like that. And then um, the interesting thing is. Um, you know how big an atom is, right? Um, namely, um, I'm not talking about this kind of angstrom size. Who cares? We are doing quantum optics, right? So we want to see how big an atom looks to light. So an atom looks for light like of the order of lambda squared, where lambda is the, the wavelength between, the, between, for example, the two levels, um, which is much bigger, um, but it's still pretty small. So what we want to do is we want to make this much bigger. And um, the idea is, of course, to make it as big as we can do it in our cooperative array. So I will talk about this. Um, that, of course, at the end goes, goes towards quantum information. And then we are trying to get into metrology. And I know you guys are much more serious about this. So this is really a very careful attempt to see how far we can push this. We are nowhere close to a serious atomic clock or so. Then there are the um, photonic edge states, which I'm actually at the end not going to talk about. Um, so forget about this for now. Um, then uh, how can one use something like that to create what we call a quantum mirror? So this I just got from the internet. I think 
to to get the superposition of these two pictures um it, it just it still needs a little bit of work and then manipulate protons and we try not to be quite as evil about this but what we are interested in is dark state and the end of course we need to do some kind of find new states of matter um questions as well and this one i might leave out if i'm if i'm running out of time so the first question is gets back to the cooperative effects so what do i actually even mean by this um so here is the the, the grandmaster and inventor of cooperative effects um, um dicky and i love this quote which is in in his original paper where he says, for want of a better term, a gas which is radiating strongly because of coherence will be called super radiant. And this, I, I, I found this quote very nice because it reminds me of this kind of people who, who regularly, regularly use the term quantum supremacy and always say, oh man, this sounds really awful, but it's now a coined term and everybody knows what it is. So it seems like Dicke felt a little bit similar about the word super radiant. Um, so I'm actually not going to talk super radiance, but I want to kind of drive home that the effects that we have there is the same physics as super radiance. So I'm talking about super radiance for a short time. So um, let's start with a single excited two level atom. So if that spontaneously decays, and we draw, we, um, we draw the intensity per atom over time, um, um, we get an exponentially decaying probability. Okay. Um, if we to, if we make two, and look again at the intensity per atom, um, these two are far enough apart that they do their decaying completely independently, and they go in different direction, etc. And thus the intensity per atom picture doesn't change. So what happens if we go, if we put them really close together? And basically, um, when I say close together, it's basically within or smaller than the wavelength of each other. Um, they already kind of, the first one decaying already a little bit um, um, stimulates the, the decay of the next one. And thus, if we have two, in the ideal case, the curve changes a little bit away from this exponential decay. And if we now do many, um, the same and many which are close enough together, the same things happen and this curve changes rather dramatically. And the reason for that, of course, is because, and this is basically my, my kind of um, picture here, is that in the ideal case, um, all of the decay interferes constructively and therefore, um, we get um, a, an intensity that goes with n squared, where n is the number of atoms. Because if you add up the, the, um, the amplitudes, um, you, the intensity goes with the number squared, right? Um, of course, the, the integral over the, over the curve has to be the same because we don't have more energy in this case, but, but this doesn't matter so much. But this is what is typically called super radiance, and this is what I show here is this ideal Dickey case. Um, I also want to say that that um, along with super radiance, people always talk about, about the buildup of collective dipoles. Please do note that this is strictly not quite true, okay? Um, because what we in in quantum optics with like two level atoms or so call a dipole is usually this kind of row ag element and the the non diagonal element of a single two um two level system that one does not build up if that one is zero to start with this one will be zero throughout the whole process um what we do get is a higher order coherence and that's what which is between atoms that's what is important here and this is also what one can see as these collective dipoles but these are these kind of flip-flop coherences that's what is really important and that's also what the physics is throughout all the rest of my talk um and but that's where you look at a, a, a dipole dipole coherence correlation function yeah that's yes, but but if you have something like that, the dipoles are not a priori um, 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 aligned because you don't have an outside field. And so the only way how they get connected is via, so if you, for example, have a two, um, a two atom density matrix, there is a row EG G 
GE element. So this is basically the coherent flip-flop element. That is the only non that one and of course the, the, the complex conjugate are the only non-diagonal elements that, that show up there. And that one is actually very important because this, this, this kind of increase of intensity you get only if that one is non-zero. Otherwise, you still get faster decay in everything, but you will not get this, this, this really fast push, um, which is typical for super radiance. So that's, that's, that's the, I should have probably put some math in here. I did not, but that's, that's basically the, yep. So does the backward backward interaction set the time scale for that? Good question. So the question was, what is the, um, what, what are they? So you, you asked for the time scales and for the dipole dipole interaction. Yeah, this, this scale, yes, exactly. So the time scale for this peak actually um, is basically the, the normal decay time that you would have for an atom without any super radiance, pretty much divided by the number of atoms. And it turns out that this is actually, even for realistic cases, very, a very, very good approximation. And the height of the peak, in fact, um, if we do intensity by intensity divided by atom already, the height of this peak goes with the number of atoms. And if you wouldn't have per atom, then of course it would go with n squared. The total intensity goes with n squared. Okay, very good. So- uh, Susanna, yeah. could I- uh follow up a little bit on the question yeah. that uh, this is Bill Phillips. And, yes, uh, I actually, I do see your name there. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I want to get a little bit more about this, the, the point you made about the fact that, that you don't have off diagonal elements in the, in the density matrix, in the, uh, what you said about not building up a dipole. Yeah. The, the thing about a density matrix is, of course, that it, it fundamentally represents an average. Yes, and I've I, I'm remembering, um, you know, back in the old days when people first started to talk about quantum jumps, there were people who said there will be no quantum jumps because look at the density matrix; it's completely ah, continuous. Oh, okay. Yeah. But of course, <laughs> it's not because you have to calculate the right correlation function. Yes. And so, could you just say a little bit more, sort of in that spirit? <laughs> yes, that's that's actually a very good question. So the point is. Um, that of course, if you manage to quickly measure what you of course do for quantum jumps, measure in the basis of the atomic polarization exactly at the time when the quantum jump happens, then you will measure a, 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 finite, a, a finite rho EG element. That's definitely correct. As long as you are basically in transition that exists, um, but um, this assumes already kind of a symmetry breaking that you do either because you know what the basis, um, the, the, the basis direction of the atom is, or because you are just doing some kind of post selection or so you just measure a few and, and at the end count only the ones that you have actually measured. And you are right on the average it's zero. So if you put that all in a, in a master equation or something like that, this will be zero. But of course there will be always times where, where single atom kind of row EGs will be non-zero. Sorry, no, I shouldn't say it like that. But to us it's not row EGs, but the single atom dipole moments would be non-zero. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But thanks for the question. That's yeah. That's 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 actually it's good to keep this in mind. This averaging over kind of instantaneous. Any other questions regarding that? All right. Then I assume the basic physics um, is kind of clear. I've done this very kind of non-mathematically here, and I will mostly keep it that way. I just want people to have a kind of an intuitive understanding of what happens. Please do note what I haven't. Where Bill has mentioned this right now, but what I haven't talked about so far is dipole-dipole interaction. Okay, and um, when when you look at Dick's original paper, dipole-dipole interaction does not show up either. But it's really at the end, it's the same physics, and the dipole-dipole interaction is very complicated, has a lot of terms, but in particular, it does have coherent terms. 
And these coherent terms are the, the ones that kind of made the build, make the build up for superradiance. So this is actually, it's a kind of a complicated interplay and most people who do either dipole-dipole interaction or superradiance um, kind of gloss over this. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about this in detail today. But I find that very interesting how this actually all fits together. So if you have any questions, please come with them. All right, so that one we had already. So what we are looking at is basically a cooperative system, which we now don't start in the excited state. We start them all in the ground state, so there will not be this, this decay. But this kind of non-zero kind of two atom or several atom kind of non-diagonal kind of coherence still exists here and that's what i want you to keep in mind but what we want to do is we want to have this um, a system like that and what we want we want to build a system that has a very strong optical response which can be engineered and uh, where we also have guided modes and this is for example um, where the topological phenomena come in um, and so we can actually call a system like that atomic matter surfaces. And if you are familiar with kind of matter materials, um, I think that that gives you a fairly good idea what you can do with this. Um, so let's look a little bit closer. Um, at um, first, I talked about um, in, in the beginning about reflection. That's actually the simplest thing that you can do with that. So we have our array of atoms. And if you assume that we have a lattice constant of the order of the wavelengths, um, so what, what you can see here, I have drawn um, these little circles around the sim single atoms that are the sizes of the atoms, right? So these, these cross sections, which are of the order of lambda squared. So somewhere thereabouts at this kind of size, um, you would expect the, the cross sections of the atoms to actually tile the whole plane. So um, it should not come as a super big surprise that if we send resonant light into there, that we can get complete reflection from that. So far, this is somewhat intuitive. But then we looked a little bit closer and actually um, um, we found that this is not true in general, but it's true for two values of the ratio between the lattice constant and the wavelengths, namely 0 0.2 and 0 0.8. Please do note that's resonant light. Um, and um, so trying to keep my clock, clock open here. So um, I should say here something for everybody who ever writes papers um, about topics that other people also are interested in. It will always, it, nobody does this, right? Um, so this will always happen um, that, that you, you finish your, your work, you find something really interesting and you say, okay, before I send this out, before I, I put that on the archive, um, um, let's, let's do a somewhat thorough search, not only of the literature, but also of the archive. And if, that's, if that stuff is really interesting, um, you will very likely find something of the archive on the archive which was submitted like somewhere between two weeks and two months before that. Okay. And so that happened to us here. Um, and this was a paper um, by the group of Charles Adams um, done by Rob Battles. Um, and they had it. Uh, um, as you can see, that was published quite a bit earlier, and I explain you in a second why, but this was really, I mean, that was just, I think, four or five weeks on the archive by the time we found this. So what do you do in that case? You go home and you cry, or um, you, you go back and say, ha, huh, that means people are really interested in that. So let's work a little bit harder, and let's, let's make this better, okay? And I have to say, this is the very, this Adams paper is very interesting, um, but they showed the phenomenon, they did the numerics, but they didn't explain where it comes from. So there was, of course, our chance, right? So um, we, we looked into this deeper, and so you will find the first paper, which is very nice, gives a couple of applications, et cetera, and ours will give the explanation. So. Um, so this is where this picture comes in, and I give you this explanation. Oh yeah, 
And this is because the reason why this works is the cooperative resonances. So this e explanation that I gave before with this tiling the plane doesn't quite cut it, <laughs> okay? So we need a little bit more for this. So here is my, here's my math for the talk today. Um, so we do a simple input output here. And so the outgoing field, and here the, the assumption for this calculation is super easy. So we have, and we are looking only in the z direction, which is the direction perpendicular to the to the array. We are assuming that our array is infinitely big, and that we don't have any dirt effects or anything like that. Okay, so that's what this calculation is about. So in that case, the outgoing field is the incoming field, which is e zero times the the forward direction, um, and um, plus, of course, the, the scattered part. And the scattered part, because of symmetry, now basically has to go uh, off in the z direction in, in either direction of our array. And if you look at this very complicated equation, you will see that the forward direction cancels if, if the scattering, um, um, the scattering constant is minus one. So that our, our um, our task got easier because we just need to find the scattering constant and find where is it minus one. Then we get this reflection. Hmm. Okay. And I make a shortcut here and just show you how the scattering constant look like. If you are familiar with such a thing, you will recognize the typical Lorentzian form of that with some decay constant gamma um, or broadening and, uh, and the, the, the um, detuning delta. But both the gamma and the delta have a, have a collective um, part to it. And this collective part, of course, is, comes from the cooperative effects. Or in that case, um, this is just then simply, simply at the dipolar interaction between all the atoms. Because we are in 2D and we have this kind of ordered lattice, um, here one can just calculate infinite sums. It's not that hard. Okay. So um, when does s equals minus one, just look at this and you find that this, um, that this becomes minus one if the total term for the detuning is zero. Please do note um, for, for those of you who kind of know 1D waveguides with a strongly coupled atom, two level atom, whatever, um, you basically get the same physics only without the collective parts. Okay, so that means that our our task yet got a little bit simpler. Namely, we now we know what our our um, what the the delta is the detuning between the resonance and the incoming light. So um, we just need to figure out what this what this delta collective is, and this one we can do. Um, and here it's drawn. Oh, sorry. Yes. So, so very naively, I would expect this to depend on the transverse wave vector. Well, you have to hit some yeah, absolutely. Yes, it, does that um, it doesn't. <laughs> so so um, there, there are two things that come in there. Sorry, I should repeat the question. So the question is that that one should think that there are some transverse modes which which play a role here as well. Um, and and um, the question was, where where is that argument wrong? It's not wrong. It's right. Okay. So right now we completely divide this in two parts, namely the 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 one that goes along the z direction, which is plotted there um, explicitly, and the one that goes in the x y direction, which is basically all hidden in 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 these terms here. Okay. Um, of course, at the end. In real life, um, things are not perfectly perpendicular, etc. So at the end, they mix. We did actually calculate that too. I'm not showing you the pictures, but since you give me this 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 hint, uh, this this kind of starting point here, I can say that this actually works extremely well. I mean, it's it's you you do get some you do get some kind of not hundred percent reflect reflection, but you get. Still very, very close to 100. There's not a question. Go ahead. When you say the infinite plane, is it infinite compared to the, the scatter mode vector or like both the mode and the scatter? Yeah, so the question was when I say infinite, infinite compared to what? So, very good question. It's actually um, infinite compared to the, to the beam where you sent your, your light in. 
And of course, it's also infinite in terms of that every single atom um, interacts in principle with, with atoms that are all the way up to infinite array. Um, but the point is that the second one doesn't matter very much. I mean, you know, dipole-dipole interaction goes with one over R to the three. Um, so this falls off pretty quickly. And it turns out that when we make, um, um, when we make, let's say, simulations with 10 by 10 atoms, that this comes already pretty close to the infinite limit. But only as long as the as the, the array is not smaller than the than the than the beam. Obviously, if the beam kind of goes by the sides of the array, it doesn't work anymore. All right. Um, thanks for the question. Good point. Okay. So this one is just a numerical calculation for this particular um, square lattice of this, um, of this collective delta. And just to point out, um, as you, what you can see here is, is the ratio of the lattice constant to the wavelengths all the way um, from basically zero, um, here we go a little higher to one. And what you also see or guess is that this, um, this diverges both at one and at zero. The divergence at zero is not very surprising because if you if you put your atoms infinitely close together, the dipole-dipole interaction gets infinitely big. And I should also actually apologize because we have here red up and blue and blue down rather than the other direction. So I should have should have switched this. Um, <clears throat> but um, so, so the, the fact that it goes, that it, that it diverges on this side um, is not so surprising. This one is perhaps, um, the one at one is not surprising if you have a little bit of an idea how resonances work. Um, one could also go higher than one, but then it gets tricky because as soon as you go higher than one, there are actually other, um, other um it, it first one and then two etc more um, um um scattering orders and you never get 100 percent anymore so you have to be in this 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 lattice constant has to be smaller than the wavelengths in order for this to work but now let's assume that our that our light is on resonance hello what do i need to do you should show me what i need to do in order to make this work <laughs> Zoom stole the pointer back. I think oh, that's that's when somebody asks a question one needs to reset. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um I, I I don't know. Yes, sorry. Okay. So here um I just make a line through zero, um, which means we have zero um zero um the outside detuning. And if you look at where this 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 um these crossing points are this one and this this other one. Oh, I'm sorry, this is really hard. Um, you see that they are exactly at A over lambda, 0 0.2 and 0 0.8. <clears throat> so the fact that these are cleanly 0 0.2 and 0 0.8 is somewhat of, a, of an accident. Um, um, but but we see how this happens. But now, of course, we can, and and the reflection curve that you see here, the yellow one that has, um, um, is the reflection curve that you can get in case of in the case of um, of resonant light. But then, of course, you can send in light um, with different detuning, and that gives you all of the other curves. And as you can see, um, there is a, a maximum red detuning that you can do. In order to still get full reflection, you can go as, as blue as you want, and you will always get these two points. Um, but that means that we basically can get full reflection anywhere for any wavelengths where we have A over lambda equal to zero if we just do the right detune. Okay. All right. So um, that is basically the first element which makes the physics work here. So is there any question regarding this, this reflection? Yeah, it's like what, what is delta collision? It's like a detuning, right? Uh, no, it's not collision, sorry, it's delta collective. Right. Uh, that's, that's a good question. I never thought about collision, but that's of course. Okay. It, it's just this collective. That's the term that comes from the interaction of, of all atoms with each other. And it's basically, 
um, the, if, if you look at this, at this expression in, ye in the yellow box, um, if you just calculate all of these terms, you get a complex number, <laughs> okay? And we just said, okay, we call delta collective the real part and gamma collective over two or minus gamma collective over two the, the, the imaginary part and then it comes in like that. Of course, in the expression in S you see why we call it like that, because obviously the gamma collective plays the role of gamma and the delta collective plays the role so of like the delta. The lowercase delta, that's like, I guess. Uh, that's the, the lowercase delta. delta. Radiation yes. Off of the residence. Yes, the exactly. So the so small. The, get more Due to the collective nature yes, exactly. So we have two detuning terms. The one is the detuning between the incoming light and the re resonance, that small delta. And then you have this collective delta, which, and I did not write the expression, which mostly depends uh, very strongly on this, on this ratio A over lambda, which is um, not very surprising because that's basically what you see on this picture here, right? Okay. So there is actually a second thing which we can see. Oh, that's at first, we did this whole calculation for square lattice because it's very simple, but it turns out any kind of regular lattice works. So triangular lattice, which is actually the one in the original kind of battles paper. Um, you can do Kagome lattices or honeycomb lattices and honeycomb lattices are of course nice because honeycomb lattices and some others have direct points. So if you want to, to kind of do anything with topology, et cetera, you would go to that. What changes is none of the basic physics, but what changes is the, these numbers of 0 0.2 and 0 0.8. The 0 0.2 becomes a little bit smaller for all of the other lattices. The 0 0.8 becomes a little bit larger. Other than that, the, the physics and the, the rough qualitative form of this delta is all the same. Okay, yeah, sorry. Is there an easy way to understand what goes wrong if the lattice is not regular? Yeah, good question. So the question is what, what, is if the lattice is not regular and um, and this implies something is wrong, right? Um, so the point is it actually um, depends on how irregular it is. So if it's completely random, you won't see much. And the reason is that um, if you have a regular lattice, you have a lot of the same distances between atoms over and over. And so that you can have kind of constructive and destructive interferences. The more different distances you have, the harder it goes. However, because of the nature of the dipole-dipole interaction, um, the main kind of distances that matter are the ones that are relatively short. So it turns out if you're something like a quasi-crystal or something like that, where, they, where, they, where the local order is still there, but the global order not, that actually works not perfect, but it works actually pretty well still. And we have done, actually together with Rob Battles, we have done some calculation on that. Um, so the second is the band diagram. Um, why do we look at the band diagram of that? So this is the, the typical band diagram of a square lattice. Um, with, with, the, with the typical symmetry points and the red, yellow and blue are the three kind of polarization directions and the, the purple line is, a, is a, a circular polarized light, but you see that qualitatively they are all fairly similar. And what is important, um, the, the little inset shows you the, the symmetry points and also this distorted lines um, in, the, in the actual square geometry. And what is important is that you have a region that is within the light cone and a region that's without the light cone. What does light cone mean in this case? Light cone means that if you are inside, so that means close enough to the gamma point, your K value um, is equal on the, on the line or smaller to the K value that you get in vacuum for the light. Okay, so that means um, that you can have something like kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared equals k squared, right? 
And if you look at kx squared at plus ky squared, you would expect that to be smaller than the total k squared, right? Where that is the case, that's what is within the light cone. And because this is all allowed and easy, et cetera, this can couple to the vacuum or to the far field. What does that mean if we are in some of those modes, they will just radiate off? Whatever excitation <laughs> we have in there will radiate off. Hi, um, Seth Levine. Can I ask a quick question here? Yeah. Just from, I'm from NIST. Just to clarify. So uh, uh, now this K is this? Does this mean you're sending the light in at an angle? Is that where the K is coming from? No, actually. Thanks for the question. Um, no, okay. it's not. The, the point is that, or oh, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, in this case, that's the general modes that that are even in principle allowable in the in the in this lattice. We have not yet determined where they come from, okay? Or how, sorry, we, uh, we have not yet determined how to excite them, okay? And that's actually a very important question. And I will go very briefly into that once I have explained what the modes are. But so far, we are just looking what are the own kind of K-modes within this two-dimensional lattice. Okay, thanks. Okay, and now, ah, works, okay. So um, obviously whatever is outside there, um, the kx squared plus ky squared is actually larger than k squared. So it's, it cannot um, energetically connect to the, to the outside world. Um, um, Zachary asked a very good question. How do we excite them? Yeah, that's of course the question, but let's assume it is excited, right? In this case, um, once we have such an excitation on the lattice, it will live there forever because it cannot, it, it will of course not, it can kind of, go off to the side, but let's assume we have an infinite lattice. It does not kind of go in the Z direction. So that means in this case, we have surface waves only. So we basically have a perfect um, waveguide in, in this case, if we can excite them. And the idea is really exactly how can we get these excitations in there in the right way, um, such that we can use that to manipulate, manipulate the light. And some of that I'm going to talk about. All right, so um, before I go to applications, um, how can we do that? I mean, one, one, obvious, one obvious case is that we have atoms in our big lattice. Um, and here I just show Marcus's um, setup because he was the first one who had, who had one of these quantum gas microscopes. Of course, in the meantime, they exist everywhere and they are very good ones. Um, Marcus still has the advantage that he, um, where he is at the, at the forefront is that he can make this accordion lattice um, and can get them actually very close together, but never mind. And so that's, that's basically what I had in mind when, I, when, when we started this. But of course, one can look at other things. And um, one, um, one, actually, before I go into this, I'm sorry, before I go into this, um, one way um, is actually to use meta surfaces. So that means to, to build little kind of gold or silver dipoles, which are on some kind of surface and kind of arrange them the right way. And that's something which we are also doing. I'm not going to talk about that any further, but it gives you an interesting, interesting option. And the next is you use solid state 2D sem semiconductors. And of course they exist, namely these, these so-called transition metal dichrocarginides or TMDs. Um, which look like that, um, um, especially from above, they look like graphene. Um, so that means they have exactly this kind of honeycomb structure that I talked before and are therefore very promising. Obviously there are some differences. Why not use graphene to start with? Um, graphene does not really support any excitons and the, the particles that would play the roles of the atoms in here would be excitons. The nice thing about the TMDs is that they have very, very good excitons. And so this is actually something which, which is studied among other people um, by, by my colleagues, Hong Kong Park and Philip Kim. And there's actually the, the first thing that they did um, um, we already quite a couple of years ago is to look at whether this stuff is really reflective if you send the right wavelengths in. And that's what you see here on the left side, you just send some light in. And here this, this TMDC mostly is kind of shown as an outline because you can otherwise not even see it. 
But if you send in the right wavelengths, you get the picture on the right side where you see that this that this um, um, reflection is nearly as good as the, the one from the platinum leads that you see at the bottom. And I could show you some spectra, et cetera. I leave that out. Um, I just would like to say that that in a touch in my Moglus group, they basically did a very similar experiment pretty much. I mean, these, these two are published back to back. Okay, so this is actually a very interesting direction. So there's a lot of applications and I meant to show you some of them. I think I will show you a lot less because it's already quarter to 12. So there's of course the thing with the perfect mirror. And the question is, can we actually use that to make perfect mirror for, for light, which usually not so easy to build a mirror for, right? In this case, of course, we have to make that very small. And this is a little bit of a of a, of a a challenge and we are working on this but i'm not going to talk about that there's obviously the waveguide what i will show you is that one can use something like that as a spatial light modulator and that's what i'm going to start with so let's assume and here uh, let's assume we are looking to the at the array from the side um here we have a couple of scatterers and we send some light in um, coherent. And of course, that gets kind of scattered off in all kinds of direction. But in particular, we have a Bragg direction where we get um, where we get constructive interference of the reflected photons. And that's basically where one sees the reflection, right? So what happens now if we take, um, yeah, exactly. So if we take half of the, the, the scatterers, and you will see that they are a little bit darker yellow, where we say, okay, we shift the phase a little bit. In that case, we something like this dark blue reflected photon comes out, and um, the, the constructive interference now will go in a little bit different direction than it was before, okay? And so you can, in principle, use that for beam steering in one direction, that looks then something like this in, in, in real life. Unfortunately, this, this paper, I think, is still not quite on the archive. Um, so here you have your TMD in the middle. Um, and you have um, this, the, the, this is on HBN as a, as a surface. That's usually what they do with TMD. And then you have um, electrodes on the bottom and the top. And you see that the top electrode goes all the, all the widths of the TMD and the bottom electron goes only half. So that means if you change the bottom half, you change the, the, the potential of the, of the left side versus the right side. And this effectively gives you, so this is how that looks in real life. Um, this effectively changes the, the upper level um, of, the, of the exciton. And of course, if you have a slightly different, a slightly different energy, you have a slightly different phase. And this is how you do this. The nice thing is this is really very small. And you can change this, this potentials on the nanosecond scale. So that means you can do this, this beam steering on the nanosecond scale that's basically faster than what anybody else can do. Um, this one gives only one direction, but then you can do instead of, of two different, you make three different, um, three different gates um, that are kind of in a two-dimensional in a two-dimensional pattern. And here, that means you can do the beam steering in two different directions. And so what they did in the lab is, is they spelled out physics with that. Okay, so this is, this is what this is about. So, so far, I should say, um, this is not really quantum. This is still very dilute excitations, et cetera. Um, but they are now working, trying to get this quantum and get the cooperative effects in and kind of get some, some, some more superposition than, than the superposition that you need um, in order to get the track scan. So um, this is in principle very promising, but it's not, it's, it's not that easy. These TMDCs are not that easy to work with. You're, you're making an array of basically. Yes, yeah. How so the, the, the excited states. And the, yes, exactly. The so the, so yeah, so the, the excitons are also done. Um, so the question is, is basically how does this translate between the atoms and the excitons, right? Um, so the, the excitons are created by putting this potential on, right? 
And of course, depending on how much potential you put on, um, that, that's how many excitons you get. And this, this, this is really done, um, just optimized to, to actually make this work. And I, I don't know on the top of my head what the density of excitons is here, but it's not very high. Okay, so um, the next one would be the topological, which is kind of, I just threw it out because it's relatively old. Um, and I, we also, you can do very highly sensitive optomechanics um, because this is of course now a mirror, which is super, super light, right? It's just a couple of atoms heavy. And so you can get very high single photon nonlinearities, et cetera. Um, this was mostly done by my former postdoc, Effie Shamon, and he is now a professor at Weizmann and basically took that part with him. So I decided I, I let him talk about that. And there are a couple of papers out on this, uh, at least on the archive, some of them. So what I will talk about is, um, let me see. Um, so it's, it's what I call quantum antenna. And um, this is the thing with the large cross section. And um, this I just showed you already. So we want to make a cross section uh, large. Um, and we want to make it basically as large as we can make the array. So um, why, why is this interesting? A, um, because what that gives us is effectively a single atom, single photon, high cross section, right? Which is a little bit kind of an, an uh, one, one of the big goals of quantum optics is to have a high single photon, single atom nonlinearities. Our single atom now is just an impurity, just an impurity in the array. But the, the cross section in principle can be ma made very large. And I spare you the mass, which is really not very illuminating. Um, but here's a couple of pictures, just the comparison. If we have only the atom with the light coming in, um, then the, this color scale shows you what the, what the scattering intensity is. And that's also what gives the, what gives the gauge here that, that you see on the, on the left side here. Um, um, because of near field um, um, effects are usually kind of twice the, the typical intensity. So that's why the yellow here is, is, is two. Now we do the same thing and look at only the array. No single photon, only the array. Um, here we get, we are not quite at this, at this point where we get full reflection. You still see a slightly light, um, lighter stripe to the right. Um, but the, the intensity scattering intensity, not very surprisingly, goes to four because we have sending wave. So the question is what happens if we put them together, right? And that can be just simulated. And it turns out this is actually rather dramatic. Um, it's very yellow, but please also look at the scale that now goes a couple of orders magnitude higher. And if you actually kind of go, go I think two or three more, um, orders of magnitude higher, you will still see something, but then the, the kind of blob is a little bit smaller. So I'm not showing any of the, of the math here, but I would like to briefly explain the physics of, of why that can happen. So what we basically have here is we have um, a field impinging on the array and everything close to instantaneously collecting on the impurity, right? That's what happens. Um, why does that happen? Because, and this goes back to, to your question that you asked before, a little bit at least. Um, um, or actually, I, I, I don't know, sorry, it might, might have been somebody else. But anyway, um, so the question is, um, how do we get some of these outside the light cone um, um, excitation in. So that's one way you, you send outside the light cone excitation. The, 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 it can, the, the, the lattice cannot hold on to it because the, it's energetically not allowed, but the impurity can be because the impurity is chosen such that it has a slightly higher resonance frequency. So um, um, what, the, what the lattice does is due, these, due to this coherent dipole-dipole interaction or cooperative effects, it sends basically everything over the whole array. But as soon as it hits, the, the excitation gets stuck there. And this is basically where this comes from. 
So I'm not going any further into that because the next thing is, ha, if we can do that with a single atom, we, we can probably use that in order to let two atoms talk to each other. So we set both of them as impurities on the array and we look what happens between them. And the first question here is really, how can they coherently exchange population with each other? And um, here we have um, defined a quality factor, um, which is basically the, the, the comparison between the coupling between the impurities versus the decay into space. And if you try that for the first time, that's what, roughly what you get. You have um, uh, the, the two impurities and their populations, and you see that they actually, um, that they oscillate between each other. If you don't do anything else, and then you can look at, oh, and I'm sorry, this, the, <laughs> it's the A over lambda on the x-axis here. Um, you have, a, you have a, a picture where you see what the, the quality factor is that's, that's encoded in the color. And you see that this is basically at the edge down there. And we also have some regions where the quality factor is really, really bad. So that would be the case where we would, where, for example, you would kind of couple in or out. And then you change a couple of things, like for example, the delta and the, the A, and also actually um, the, the polar for this picture, the polarization of the light. And you see that the quality factor is actually, I mean, on for the other picture, the best quality factor is 100. For the, for the lower picture, the best quality factor is a million. So one can actually go pretty well for this. And so this is also why you don't see any, um, any going down of these oscillations here. And um, here I would like to kind of leave this one out um, because um, that explained, needs some more explanation. If you have some more questions regarding that, I'm happy to do that. So then the next thing is, can we make an on-array quantum computer? That's of course a big step further. First of all, we have to look closer into whether these single impurities are actually good nonlinearities. Um, and in particular, we have to look at the G20 function, which is happening right now. And um, we have kind of done this a little bit out of order. What we have done is the lower half in, in orange. So we have looked at how one can use these um, these one or two or more atoms in order to do single and two qubit gates. That doesn't work in the, in the setup that I've shown you, but if you go to three level atoms, it's actually pretty easy. Okay, so um, I think what I will do, so, so when do you want me to stop? So it's five to noon. I think we started a little bit late, so maybe five, maybe 10 more minutes. Okay, good. So, um, I think I leave that one out. Um, the problem is that now, before I was, that I knew how to go over this. So that one, I don't show you. And this would be the quantum sensing. It turns out that, that some of these effects that I showed you before are very, very, very narrow. That's, that's the, the ideas about that. Let me talk to you, however, about lattice momentum states. So um, there, um, um, there's of course always the idea about dark states. And if you have dark states, you can do stir up and you can kind of coherent, kind of moving around stuff, et cetera. And that's, that's one of, of these examples. So in particular, can we use them to store photons and on, modify them? I should say that this has been done here um, by, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't recognize everybody, but by, certainly by some of you in the audience, um, using Ripper kind of three level systems. And this kind of up to a point um, repeats that physics, but the, the states are different. So that's what we call lattice dark states. So here is the, the idea. So let's assume we have a lattice that is somehow modified periodically. For example, you put some super lattice on, which puts a little bit of a light shift on, such that, that they have slightly different um, detunings, the, the red and the blue ones. Could be done in checkerboard patterns or any other pattern. And what we get is if we go into the Brion zone um, for, this particular, um, for, for this particular example, we have now, um, have gone from basically the, the gamma symmetry into the M symmetry. Um, and the, the step from gamma to M is done by, by putting these detuning patterns on. 
So um, what we have effectively, even if you might not have seen it, is a three-level system. So our three-level system um, it can be explained like that. First of all, we, we assume one excitation. So the, the, the ground state is the ground state, no excitation, OK? Um, the, this what is called K-state, which I call driven delta equals 0, is if you just send some light in, but without this kind of super lattice pattern. And the third one is, is the field where, where you have the super lattice pattern in. So, and you have effectively, obviously, a coupling between G and K, um, which is just driving or not. And you have coupling between an effective coupling between what is K and K plus pi, because in the Brion zone, it turns out that this K goes into K plus pi, if you do that, um, is by, by cranking on this delta. And this is, of course, a very nice and stable um, lambda type system, which has, which has dark states and where you can do stir up, et cetera. That's the idea. And so we have um, done a couple, and here is actually also this, this paper that I mentioned before cited. There is another paper. This is the second one in orange, which is, um, which is another of those papers, which when we wanted to put that on the archive, we looked. And in that case, I think it came out three days before. So um, turns out that that this Janne Rostikowski's paper is actually, the basic idea is the same. They go off in a little bit different direction with that. But um, it's a very nice paper. So actually, ours, for some reason, ours is also on the archive. I forgot to cite that. But um, have a look at that if you're interested in that kind of physics. So the question is, can we store a photon and retrieve it with high efficiency? Obviously, yes. Otherwise, I would not talk about that. Um, and for the retrieval, we made the, the calculation a little bit more realistic. Um, namely, we assumed that our light it has had Gaussian profile. And that, of course, gives us it gives a, a, a the uncertainty on on the on the on the system, and so what we did, we looked at the at the retrieval efficiency um, as a function of the Gaussian based, and it turns out that actually that helps us more than it hurts. Um, I say roughly hundred percent, of course not hundred percent. In that case, never hundred percent, but we come pretty close. So um, this is. This is what one sees. This is the simulations for, for two lattice sites. The one is 15 squared, the one is 21 squared. And um, on the on the x-axis is the waste size, size of the Gaussian. So you want to go over a couple of lattice size, but not all. Um, and on the y-axis is 1 minus the fidelity. And of course, that's what we want really small. <laughs> And as you can see already for, for a 21 by 21 lattice, um, we get basically a, a 4.9 fidelity in this case. Okay, That's, of course, the ideal case when we choose the waste exactly right. And also, if we don't wait. If we wait, that gets worse. It's not very surprising. But it's actually, fortunately, not too, too bad. So if you wait 50 lifetimes, um, you still you still got get to a 99% fidelity in this case of the retrieval. One can say much more to this, but I don't. Um, I yep, yep, sorry. Yes, what's absolutely. The, what's the temporal profile of the photon that's going into? Ah, yeah. So the question, a very good question. The question was what's the temporal profile? Um, we actually have calculated this. It's it's there are a couple of possibilities. Um, it's actually a little bit away from a Gaussian. It's the, the, the optimal one is a is a, a, a a mixture of a Gaussian and a seesaw. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have the pictures in here, but yes, there is an optimal temporal profile. Um, yeah. So is there not an exponential because they have reduced the radiation density? And so the question is, it's not inversely exponential because of the weird radiation pattern. Yes. It is somewhat, I think it's, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, there's a picture also where, where it shows how this deteriorates. And it deteriorates, I think, roughly with an exponential, but it's a fairly slow exponential, but it has some wiggles on top of it because of the weird radiation pattern indeed. Okay, so um, here, this is basically what I said already, but here is one more thing. So we can now, of course, instead of kind of moving to one other Brion zone, we can mix them up. 
So for example, we can store with a pattern like this with, with vertical stripes and retrieve in a different retrieve is now in, in quotes um, in a in a different pattern and thus actually create oscillations between those two modes. And then of course you can go to three and to four, etc. Here is just an example. Turns out it depends on how strong you make the, the tuning. That's not very, very surprising. And here, here is an example where we do three. And what one of the next things is, is actually to try to, to um, um, use machine learning or something like that to basically create an arbitrary kind of radiation pattern for this. So, and I think my, my kind of five to 10 minutes are over now, so I will just stop, but I would like to show you the, the, um, all the people, so I will go through there really fast and, and leave out all the stuff. Um, as you see, I, I, I was prepared to talk really long, okay? Um, that's, um, oh, actually, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm not going to show this, but we also started to do quantum machine learning. So if somebody is interested in that, I would love to talk about this. But that one I need to show because these are really the people who did the work, in particular, the, the upper, the upper um, line with pictures. I think each of them, um, so Effie, whom I talked about already, my student Taylor, my student Oyol, postdoc Stefan, postdoc Valentin, postdoc Rivka, each of them basically has, has one of those, those projects. And there's a lot of other people on the papers which are on here. And um, with that, I just want to thank you. And in particular, I want to thank you for the many questions. That allows me to to kind of really cut down all of this extra stuff. <laughs> but if anybody is interested in that, of course, um, let, let me know. I'm happy to talk about this. Okay. Yeah. So I was just wondering. So presumably these are sort of phonon-free calculations. Do you have any no. idea? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes and no, sorry. Um, so, <laughs> so the question was that whether these are phonon free calculations. Um, the, mostly yes. Okay. We did put some phonons on it, and we did actually um, even calculations that emphasize the phonons. But this is this that that's that's in this kind of complex of of um, of quantum optomechanics, which I didn't even put in the talk. Um, um, where, where, which is actually, I mean, that's that's that gets complicated. There are a lot of different phonon modes. The first question, however, is probably if you have any phonons, how much worse does every any of that stuff get? Okay, um, and it turns out it gets worse, but it really does not get that much. That was so. If you let's say if your phonons, um, if the phonon amplitudes are, let's say, not more than or or the uncertainty of the of the location or so is not more than about ten percent of the of the distance, um, the the um, the way how it goes away, the percentage that it goes away from perfect is about the percentage that it gets worse that it gets worse than hundred percent. If you are much further away from that, it gets more complicated. That's not a linear relationship. And that's where the optimal mechanics comes in. But up to that point, um, any kind of, also if you have holes in the system or something like that, as long as you are kind of in the single percentage regime of errors in the array, you are in the single percentage kind of one minus fidelity, fidelity regime. Okay, yes? So in the, when you look at two impurity sets for this, the ten super high quality factor, you put the thing up to an antenna that should couple real strongly to be a factor, right? So, so I would expect a low quality factor. Okay. <laughs> Very, very good question. Um, the, the question is, um, we have hooked the two impurities to, to what I called an antenna. And um, the, the idea would be that the antenna very kind of effectively um, 
throws all the excitations out in the vacuum. Why doesn't that happen? So that, that, that has two answers. A, if we are in the ideal case or what I kind of sold you as the ideal case, namely a very high quality factor, I think probably the, the, the expression antenna is not very good because in that case, it doesn't do antenna because, they, because they, the excitation in fact never kind of can hold on to the array. It can hold on only to the impurity. Um, and um, that's, but of course, as you have seen, this this high quality region is relatively small compared to the to the whole parameter regime. So if you go somewhere where you get this quality, I mean, we have also very very low quality factors, right? Ten to the minus six or something like that. These are, of course, the areas where where exactly what you said happened, where it where it radiates off very well. So you just you just kind of choose your poison there, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so the, the question, I mean, and now I have to repeat the question, the complicated question. So the question is a question both to the to the special spatial light modulator, and and how we how we play around with all of this kind of um, which which things are within the light cone and outside of the light cone or even outside of the Brion zone, which of course is another region which we actually heavily use, which I haven't told you so far. So in fact, um, that's the this this spatial light modulator that I showed you does not use any of that so far. Hopefully they will. Um, this is, um, as I mean, I, I don't know who of you um, knows Tron, but this of course, and an, 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 I'm, I'm a theorist, right? So I kind of, I give input, but this is in one of Misha's labs. Um, um, so this is classical in the sense that you don't use all of this, okay? But, the idea is, of course, that in order to do this really well, you use exactly that. You move exactly your 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 actual kind of um, um, excitation line um, between inside the light cone, outside of the light cone, outside of the Brillouin zone. And in fact, outside of the Brillouin zone of the lattice atoms is what heavily plays into this kind of two impurity thing. In fact, and that's really the, the, the trick on how do you do the geometry, like with this lattice dark states or, or the, the kind of relationship between, between um, um, frequencies and, and lifetimes, et cetera, in order to kind of make all of these, these regimes accessible. At the end, that's really the trick. And I mean, I think you can go a lot further than what I've shown here. I've shown here just a couple of the basic ideas, but at the end, it would be really interesting um, to, to try to combine as many of these things as possible. And as I said, at some point, this is not fun to do that by hand anymore. So that's really if, if somebody wants to play around this kind of uh, machine learning or something like that. So we have started, I, I, I started, I've started to have a lot of undergrads and the undergrads these days, they're amazingly good at, at programming it. They love, many of them love to do that kind of stuff. So I hope that's going to happen soon. So we have started discussing this. Bill had a question. I saw a hand go Oh, yes. Um, yeah. actually, it's a question that was inspired by Alicia's question um, about phonons. So what I'm wondering is um, if you uh, allow phonons, then what about the effect of cooperative or cooperativity, let's say, on the zero phonon line? In other words, a Mossbauer or Lambdicky like uh, effect where you don't get a recoil of the atoms. What, what, what was popping into my mind was, is the this whole business of, of cooperativity and interactions going to affect that? Yes, yes, excellent question. Thank you so much. Um, that's actually, in fact, that was our first 
um, the, the, it was not the first question that we asked because we didn't know that how to ask it, but the first real result, um, what happens to the, between the zero phone online and the, the lowest phone on mode? And it turns out that you get actually um, very, um, that this is at the end really a question of geometry. And if you said, I mean, obviously, if you do um, optomechanics, you have, a, you have a cavity, right? Um, and if you set up the geometry of your cavity in the, in the right way, and in the right way, and for, for, the, for the simplest question, it's very simple. You just have to make sure that your, that, that your cavity is very contained and very kind of only, or as much as possible in the Z direction. I will show you a picture. I actually probably have one. Um, let me just go somewhere down there and see whether I still have this in there. Just it's only one picture and I might not find it. And in this case, I'm not going to talk about it. Um, okay, so um, so what, what you could have, and this is basically, this is unfortunately only the first picture. So um, here, this, this would be an, an ideal cavity, in particular, the upper one, which, which has the, which is not the, the um, membrane in the middle, but where, where you actually have one side. Um, it turns out that the lowest excitation, it's not very surprising, is just the, the one where you, where you actually bent your array um, in symmetry with the cavity. And that one turns out to be um, um, quadratic with the, with the, with the, with the, the movement, with the movement in Z direction. So that means in the lowest state, you actually really have something which is a little bit akin to a mass power effect. Um, if you go higher, that doesn't work anymore. But, but in this particular case, you actually indeed see a, a, some, kind, some kind of narrowing um, um, in terms of phonons. It's not as good as mass power though, <laughs> but you wouldn't expect this here, right? 